you pray. technical difficulties there. Had no audio for a little while, but I'm with you now. As it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be at the coming of the Son of Man. Jesus is coming, and hard times are coming too. We've got to be prepared. We have to become warriors for God, warriors for Christ, God's army in the earth today. Hallelujah. Well, good evening, everybody. This is Frank Dupre. I'm glad you're with me tonight. And... Uh see I've had a couple of technical difficulties getting online tonight getting uh, over here tonight and seeing what's going on and we should be here any second live with the screen coming up let's see what's going on with that here pull it push there we go finally all right God bless you guys I'm so glad you're here tonight and uh, I'm looking forward to uh, spending some time together going over the last days the end times, see what God is doing here in our lives today and how we're going to be working with this and taking care of things together. I'm just popping out my chat so I can be with you guys and bless the Lord together. Okay? All right. So if you're here, say hello. Okay, guys? Just uh, give me a little chat there. Say hello. Let me know you're in tonight. It looks like we got a couple of people waiting online already. God bless you all for being here. And I just want to thank God for what's going on today. Again, just give me a moment here. Let's see if we can get these things going here. All right, I think we're live. All right, praise God. As it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be at the coming of the Son of Man. Praise God, at the coming of the Son of Man. Thank you, Jesus. He is coming back, and he is going to uh, work with those who are ready for him. We need to be ready for Christ's return. How do we do that? We've got to become warriors for God. You know, I've been reading a little bit about what Corey Ten Boom said about the last days, about the end times. You know, Corey Ten Boom, I put something up on Facebook uh, today, early this morning, I guess it was. And it was some of the things that Corey Ten Boom talked about concerning these last days. When she said that uh, tribulation needs to be talked about. And that's what's going on. So many people, they just don't recognize that, you know, we need to talk about the things of God, what's going on, and uh, how God is working in our lives today, and not allow things to uh, distract us from God's will for our lives. God's will for your life is that you would be a people who are prepared for His end time purposes. That was the mantra of Brother Wade Taylor, my spiritual father, Wade Taylor. And he talked about always preparing a people for the end time purposes of God. And I believe that, ma that mantle has now landed on me. And that is the calling that I have in my life. I feel so strong. I'm here to prepare you for the end time purposes of God. We've got to be ready for what God wants to do in these last days. Amen. So while we're getting ready for what God is doing, we also have to be a people of hope, a people of courage. Yes, hard times are coming. Yes, tribulation is on the way. But we can be stronger because greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. Amen? All right, praise God. So, uh, again, you know, some of you guys, I, I have a chat up here, and I think it's actually a little bit old. I'm not sure. Um, so if you guys would work with me on this and help me out, with this uh, chat, okay? Just give me one second while I kind of go to tonight. 
right now. Okay. In the last days with Frank Dupre. Okay. I'm working on this here. Sorry, guys. Uh, let's see. Live now. Here we are. Now we're live. Okay. Okay. Just give me one second while I kind of go. There you go. See, I'm, uh, I'm so sorry, guys, that these things are happening sometimes, you know, but praise God. Um, guys, uh, let's see. Live let now. get that. I don't, I want to get here. That we go. Here. Now we're live. Okay. 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 Just... All right. Let me pop this. Sometimes, you know, but praise out. God. And then I um, can get rid of this. Guys, uh, let's see. Live now. Okay. See if I got this chat out yet. Okay, I'm gonna try it again. Ah, oh, the, the the wonders of technical difficulties. Praise the Lord, anyhow. Amen. Let's see if I can get this going here, and then we can get right into what we're doing tonight. Praise the Lord. Again, I think I have an old chat up here on my screen. So, if you guys don't mind uh, saying hello, if you're there. Just give me a little amen or hello, say hi so I can see who you are and that you're here with me tonight, okay? All right. Thanks for your help on that. I appreciate it. Let's see if this one will work. Because uh, without the chat, I don't know what you're saying or what you're thinking or how you're adding things on here or whatever. Again, I think I've got a whole bunch of old chats on here. So just give me a second. Maybe I can get this on my phone at least so I can uh, work with you guys on this, okay? I'm signing into the chat right now, and let's see what happens here. Where are you, chat? Oh, there you are. Okay, good. All right, looks like I got a few people over here tonight. Maybe I'm in the right chat. I don't know. Okay. Let's see. The last people I've got here are Donna Roman saying hello, Alberta saying Daniel 2, 31 to 43, and Jack McAlevey saying hello. I think that's last week, but anyway... We're going to move right ahead. Okay, so Luke 17, 26. This is a key verse. We have to remember this verse. Luke 17, 26. As it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be at the coming of the Son of Man. Things are going to go right back to the way they were back then. We are where we are now in these last days. We've been in the last days. I, you know, I had a, a great opportunity to share with somebody recently. They said, are we living in the last days? And I took them to Peter's message at Pentecost almost 2,000 years ago when he said, it was written that in the last days, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And God did that on Pentecost. So we are in the last days. Amen. Now, the question I want to ask tonight, we want to get into this tonight a little bit is, why did the Lord flood the whole earth in the days of Noah? As it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be at the coming of the Son of Man. So why did the Lord flood the earth in those days? What was going on that he felt he had to flood the whole earth? Okay? Let's see if we can figure this out. All right? I've got to try to join this chat again, see if I can get this thing up right. I'm so sorry, guys, for these technical difficulties, but this is what happens sometimes. You just can't get these things going right. Every time I pop this thing out so I can follow it, it makes me sign in again, and I think I end up with last week's stuff. All right. Okay, so let's see what we got here. All right, got the chat going here. This, this, That's this week, Pastor. All right. Hallelujah. Donna said hello five minutes ago. Okay, Nikki, hi. How you doing? All right, let's see who we got here tonight. Praise God. Andy, God bless you, Andy. Diane Fleming, good to have you here. Jack, Melissa, uh, nice to have you on board. Um, let's see, we got Alberta, Pastor Anna Brown from Pennsylvania. And let's see, I have no video. Yeah, there's nothing. I'm so sorry things weren't going so good here. Uh, let's see. All right, we're, but we're on now. I got Peter on here. I got Pete on tonight, Joanne Rolizzi. I uh, haven't seen her for a long time. Used to be a member of the church up here years ago until she moved away. So, why did the Lord flood the earth? Let's look at a verse and see why did the Lord flood the earth, okay? Here we're going to go, 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 4 and 5. For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell. That word is Tartarus. It's not the word that we think of hell. The angels are not in hell. They're in a prison called Tartarus. 
And he delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment. And spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly. What was going on is that the world was so ungodly, and it was filled with ungodly beings. The Nephilim were here at that time. You guys, you guys know what happened there in Genesis chapter 6, uh, verses 1 and 2. And it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, that the daughters were born to them, and the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair. That word fair is, is really not a good translation. The word there is really that they were beautiful, gorgeous, that they were, you know, desirable. And they took them wives of all which they chose. And you know what happened with that. They then uh, took them as their wives. And then these women had babies. And these babies, the story goes that when they were pregnant and they gave birth, sometimes they would die because these uh, Nephilim that were being born were so big that they would actually kill the women that were giving birth to them. And they became the giants of old. And the world was filled with this. Now, if you remember, I talked about this recently. This took place the, that in the days of Jasher. And Jasher was uh, one of the patriarchs back in the times of uh, Noah before him, 1,200 years before the flood. 1,200 years before the flood. Now, those of you who remember a little bit of your Greek mythology from high school, you'll remember that the Greeks talked about a golden age when the gods lived among men. They're talking about these 1,200 years when fallen angels, the gods, lived among men, and then the mighty men of old, Ajax, Hercules, Mercury, or whoever else they were, Achilles, these were the children of the gods. They were the giants. If you remember, there, you know, in ancient times, of course, we have so much uh, going on. I mean, you have the, the, the TV show Hercules back a while ago. And, and a great brother in the Lord played Hercules there. He's a great born-again Christian, a real strong man of God. But, you know, they show him as a man. I mean, maybe he's six foot tall. Maybe he's 210 pounds. But that's not what Hercule, Hercules was like. Hercules was a giant. Hercules, there's a, there's a carving of Hercules holding a lion under his arm. The head of a lion fit under his arm like you would hold a big cat. And it talks about how he killed the lion, just like a cat to you and me. I'm six foot tall. Well, I used to be anyway. I'm six foot tall. If I held a cat over here, I could snap its neck. That would be like Hercules, who was probably 15 feet tall, holding on to a lion, and snapping its neck and killing it. These were the giants of old. And God destroyed the earth. He flooded the earth to get rid of the Nephilim. Now, the fallen angels didn't die. The fallen angels were cast. When the flood came, the fallen angels were cast into Tartarus, which was a prison. And that prison is where they still are until the judgment. Now, what judgment? Well, that's, that's in the book of Revelation. In the book of Revelation, we see that a mighty angel has a key to the bottomless pit, Tartarus. He unlocks it, opens it up, and these things come out. These fallen angels that have been locked up for thousands of years are going to get out at some point way into the into the into our future they're going to come out we need to be prepared now one of the things that we have to understand when we're talking about this stuff okay fallen angels absolutely wicked how did the fallen angels miss noah's bloodline god preserved him and noah and noah and his family didn't mess around with fallen angels you know it just it just god preserved them he was preserving his his lineage and uh, that's how he did it. And they didn't choose. You know, they, they, don't forget, human beings have a choice also. You know, if, if a fallen angel or if a spirit comes to you, you have power in the name of Jesus to rebuke it so that it does not do something to you that you don't want to happen. Amen. And Noah was protected by God. His wife, his children, his sons were protected of God and they were kept so that their, their lineage was pure. And remember, we talked about how Noah was perfect in his genealogy, meaning that his genealogy had no fallen angels, no Nephilim blood. He was a man. What happened is mankind became corrupt. And not only did mankind become corrupt, the world was so ungodly. These fallen angels did things that they created what we call chimera. 
and the chimera are part animal, part human. They are, they are not uh, eternal creatures. They do not have an eternal soul. These things are, were, were, were horrors and aberrations. You've heard of the, uh, the, the horse with the head of a man. You've seen in maybe Egyptian stuff. You've seen the man with the head of a, of a hawk. Uh, his name was Thoth, and they called him a god. And uh, the, these were creatures that were made by the fallen angels, mixing the genealogy and the DNA of humans and animals. And you know, they're doing it today. 150 chimeras have been created. These are combinations of different animals, and some of them have human, gene human genes in them too. And we know of 150 that were declared by one of the governments of the world today that are doing these things, and, and believe me, if a government stands up and says, we've got 150 chimera that we've created now, mixing animals with animals and things like that, you can bet your bottom dollar that, they're, that they've got 150 that they're not talking about. They've got thousands of these things that are being created in different laboratories around the world, Japan, China, Russia, England, America. These are black labs that are, that are producing these things again. Amen. So, God destroyed the world, and when he flooded the earth, he destroyed these chimera also. Now, when he flooded the earth, something, something uh, in particular happened, and all the Nephilim died. Those that had not died already, there were, there were wars among them, there were battles among them, and there were all sorts of things going on, but those that were alive died in the flood. Now, those that had died already and those that died in the flood, they are what the Bible calls disembodied spirits. The book of Enoch talks about this in particular and tells us that the disembodied or the spirits without a body, the Nephilim, spirits without bodies now, they are demons. And you have power over demons. You can cast them out. If you come, come in contact with a demon and you're walking in Christ, you can cast them out. You don't want to be like the sons of Sceva, seven sons of a man named Sceva, who said that in the name of Jesus, whom Paul preaches, we cast you out. And the demon said, we know Paul and we know Jesus, but we don't know you. You don't have no power or authority over us. Too many people are playing around with demons and playing around with this type of stuff, and they're not ready for it yet. So get ready, walk with God, get strong in the Lord, build your faith, read the word of God, Talk to the Lord each day, build your relationship with the Holy Spirit, and put on the whole armor of God and grow up as a son and daughter of the Most High. Amen. Yes, amen. Michelle Olowski, good to have you here. She's saying, yeah, we need to lift each other up in prayer and pray for discernment. Amen. Now, if you're with me on Facebook, on any of my Facebook pages here, and you want to be a part of the chat, you have to go to www.frankdupre.online. And that'll bring you right to where we are right now, live on that website. That's the website that we had built specifically for our Sunday services and for these Monday nights and for any other times I do special meetings like this, okay? Now, it's getting a little bit late. I want to keep on moving. Sorry, I had all that te technical difficulties in the beginning. I had no sound. That's why I had nothing going on. I didn't, I didn't start the show because I had no sound. Okay, let's go to our next scripture. It's Jude chapter 1, and there, of course, there's only one chapter in Jude. Verse 5, starting at verse 5, it's actually 5 and 6. Uh, and I'm reading from the Kenneth Wiest translation of the New Testament because he gives a, a particular um, phraseology. He words it in a certain way I want to bring out to you, okay? Moreover, after mature consideration, I desire to remind you, though you know all things once for all, that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, then destroyed those who did not believe. And angels who did not carefully keep inviolate their original position of preeminent dignity, but abandoned once for all their own private dwelling place with a view to the judgment of the great day and everlasting bonds under darkness he has placed under careful guard. So he's saying what I just told you that Peter said. They're saying the same thing. These fallen angels who did not keep inviolate. In other words, they didn't keep pure their original position. Their original position is that they're supposed to be in the heavens as watchers, 
watching over mankind, helping mankind. But they came in and they corrupted mankind and they corrupted the earth. So God now has reserved them in darkness for judgment. Now, the next verse, just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them, in like manner to these, to who? To the fallen angels, having given themselves over with a complete abandonment to fornication and having gone after a different kind of flesh. Tonight, we're talking about strange flesh. They're being set forth as an exhibit, undergoing the punishment of everlasting fire. Now, he says that these particular people of Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them were burned in that fire, that, that tremendous explosion of fire that took place when the angels of God came and destroyed those cities, 10 cities that they destroyed. They were burned up in that fire. The problem was, now everybody talks about Sodom and sodomy. Yes, that's the sin, and that is a sin of sodomy. Homosexuality was a great sin there, but it wasn't just that. They went after strange flesh. Human flesh to humans is not strange flesh, okay? And when the angels came and left their place in the heavenly realm and came to the earth, they went after strange flesh. They, having a different type of body than humans, came and took a different kind of flesh. As Wiest says, they went after a different kind of flesh, okay? And that was the sin that they committed. And that was the grievous sin of Sodom and Gomorrah and the ten cities. They were outright seeking sexual relations with angels. They were trying to get back what had happened before the flood, all right? Now, that's, that's in uh, Jude chapter 1, verse 5 when, and 6, when he's talking about this and telling us what happened. Now, we're going to go into a little bit tonight about this concept of heavenly bodies, earthly bodies, celestial bodies, terrestrial bodies. We're going to go here to 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 5, okay? 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and I'm going to read this to you. We know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle was dissolved, in other words, if we died, and our flesh corrupts, is corrupting, we have a building of God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. A house not made with hands, not of this earth. We have a heavenly body awaiting us, all right? We're, we're, it's eternal. It'll be eternal in the heavens. And in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house which is from heaven. So just as this body is my house, my spirit, and soul live in this house, and my spirit and soul earnestly groan, wanting to be clothed with a different type of house. Now, you got to look at the word clothe, like clothing, and house, a place to live in, all right? Verse 3, if so be that being clothed, we shall not be found naked. So what he's saying is this, those who die without Christ, will not have a heavenly body. So spiritually, they're naked. They are not clothed with a heavenly house. Their earthly house is gone. It's corrupted. Now they're naked. Their spirit, their soul is naked. And he says, we shall not be found naked. We that are in this tabernacle, this house, this tent, we groan, being burdened, not for that what we would be unclothed, but to be clothed upon, that mortality might be swallowed up in life. He's saying that, he, that we, are, we, are, we are groaning to have the eternal body, the body that God has prepared for us in the heavens. Now, if you remember in the Garden of Eden, what happened when Adam disobeyed God. Eve was deceived. Adam disobeyed. Okay? They were naked. They were physically naked before they sinned. It's not talking physical nakedness. They're talking about... Uh, 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 there's what, what the Bible is telling us is that Adam and Eve were clothed upon with celestial bodies. But when they sinned, those bodies were removed. 
They died spiritually. They had a spiritual house, a tabernacle. They were living in an eternal situation. And God said, we have to put them out of the garden so, because if they stay here in the garden, in this condition, eating of the tree of life, they'll live forever. In what? In a corruptible body. <clears throat> he didn't want that to happen. All right. Andy's asking a question. How did the fallen DNA get back if God locked them up after the flood? Well, um, if one crook came to my house and he got captured, what's to stop another crook? From coming to my house. Nothing. The fear of being captured? Well, maybe they're not going to get captured. I don't know. God had a judgment on those first ones. After that, we'll get into these things. We're going to talk about these things as the weeks go by. I can't talk about it all in one night. Let's stick to this. We're talking strange flesh tonight, okay? All right, so we are desiring our soul and spirit desire to be clothed upon with a heavenly body, a habitation, a dwelling, a tabernacle, a house. That is eternal, not, not mortal. Immortality, not mortality. And so now in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 35 to 49, I'm not going to read them all, but this is a, this, these are verses that are read at funerals many times. Some will say, how are the dead raised up? With what body do they come? Foolish person, don't you know that you don't get what you sow? If you sow a seed, you don't get a seed back. You get a, you get a plant. <coughs> And he's saying that when our bodies are basically like a seed sown in the ground, we're not coming up out of there with, a, with a, the same body. We're coming up with a new body. And so he says this in verse 40. He says, there are heavenly or celestial bodies, and there are also earthly or terrestrial bodies. There are heavenly bodies, and there are terrestrial earthly bodies. Okay? Heavenly and terrestrial. So... This is what we're talking about here. And if you read that, you'll find out, he goes down in verse 45, he says, the first Adam was made a living soul, the last Adam was made a quickening or a life-giving spirit, talking about Jesus. And then he says this, the first man is of the earth, earthly, and the second man is the Lord from heaven. And as is the earthy, such are they also that are earthy. We are of Adam's race, so we all have corruptible, human, mortal houses, tabernacles, bodies, okay? And as is the heavenly, so are those of the heavenly. And as we have borne the image of the earthly, so shall we also bear the image of the heavenly. Jesus is now in a resurrected body. He bore the image of the earthly. He became one of us. But now he's resurrected and he has, he's been clothed upon. He's not naked. Hallelujah. He's not naked like Adam and Eve were naked. He's clothed upon like the demons are naked. He's clothed upon with a eternal, immortal, celestial, or heavenly body. A house, a tabernacle, a tent, whatever you may call it. He's clothed upon with that now, okay? And that is what we're looking at. That's our future. God has for us a future where we are going to have heavenly bodies just like that. You know, uh, ladies, you may have had a great body when you're young, but it might not be so great now. But remember, one day you'll have a heavenly body. Amen? All right, don't forget that. You'll have a heavenly body. And you know, we won't be caring about our bodies. We won't be caring about our flesh. We're going to only be caring about our relationship with Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Now, let's go back to this strange flesh business and get back into this now, okay? Let's go to Genesis chapter 11. And we're going to look at verses 1 through 4. Genesis chapter 11, verses 1 through 4. Okay? I'll type that in for you guys so you can uh, follow up on that one. Okay? Genesis 11, 1 through 4. Now, the whole earth was of one language and of one speech. And it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar and they dwelt there. They journeyed from the east, and they found a plain in the land of Shinar. This is the area of Babylon. This is the area of Iran. Okay? And they said to one another, Hey, let us make bricks and burn them completely. And they had brick for stone, and they had slime for water. And they said, Let us build a city and a tower, whose top may reach unto heaven. And let us make us a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the earth. Okay? 
Uh, Andy, I know you got a great question there. Why were angels allowed to come into the flesh, but man can't go into the spirit world? Well, in actuality, in the ancient times of pre-flood, people, men, had also sexual relationships with the female angels. And other things were happening there. So things like that were happening at that time. All right? And remember, uh, fallen angels don't play by the rules. Okay? So there's, it's not like there was a rule. Angels can come here and do this, but people can't go there and do that. That's not a rule. They broke the heavenly rule. They left their inviolate, their pure place in the heavenly realm. And they came here seeking strange flesh. They saw women and they wanted them and they desired them, and they took them, and they left their habitation. I talked about this a few weeks ago. They left their habitation, which is what Peter and Paul are telling us is our house, our body. They left their celestial body and took on earthly bodies, and now they're in chains, tied up, okay? So, there's a lot more. We'll go into all these things. Great questions, and then we'll go over the weeks. We'll be going through these things, okay? Now, let me ask you a question. How dumb do you think these ancient people were? Do you think they were really dumb? I don't think so. You know, many of these ancient people knew things that we don't know anymore today. They, uh, they, had, they had knowledge of the stars. They had knowledge of the planets. They had knowledge of the constellations. And they had this before modern man discovered it. And they already knew about it. And we have things in antiquity. We have relics. We have uh, images. We have pieces of clay that were made into different things, showing these different things, doing that too. Holy angels came in the flesh also. Holy angels didn't come in the flesh. They are able to come among us and partake of stuff, but they don't take women as their wives. If they did that, they'd be fallen angels, not holy angels. Okay? So, good question. Good comment there. Now, they, these ancient people were not dumb. They were not trying to build a skyscraper to go into, you know, God's heaven. They weren't trying to build a skyscraper to that heaven. They weren't trying to build a skyscraper to the clouds. What they were building was, according to this, they were building a city with a tower whose top may reach into the heavens. In other words, they were building a tower which was to become a portal. You've heard of portals. You've heard of these things. Stargates, portals, things like that. That's what they were building. A portal into the second heavens. The realm where the fallen angels dwell. Not the ones that are in Tartarus. They're in, they're in prison. But the other fallen angels, we don't know how many there are. Thousands? We don't know. But they're in the second heavens. These are the powers and principalities, the rulers of the darkness of this world. They are the wicked spirits in heavenly places. They wanted to build a tower, a portal, so they could enter into this and have interaction with these fallen angels again, just as it was before the flood. This is only a little while after the flood. This is not that long afterwards. The flood is Genesis 6. This is chapter 11. This is only years, 50 years, 100 years, whatever it may be. And they wanted to go back. They were looking to have strange flesh again. They wanted to have this interaction with the fallen angels. And let's go to Genesis 19, okay? I'm going to put that one here. Genesis 19. Genesis 19, 1 through 5. Okay? Genesis 19, 1 through 5. And uh, Andy's making another comment here. He says, they taught humans how to do things. These ancient people taught women to wear makeup. It was the fallen angels who taught women the art of seduction, which was a part of wearing makeup for seduction. And that is true. I already mentioned that before. Okay? So again, I'm not here to talk tonight about the fallen angels, what they did, what these fallen ones did, and how they did these things like that. Yes, they did those things, but that's not where we're at tonight. We're on strange flesh, okay? So, let's go on with this. Genesis 19, 1 through 5. There came two angels to Sodom in the evening. These are the two angels that were with Jesus, with God, and sitting with Abraham, having a meal, eating and drinking with Abraham in his, underneath his tent covering when the Lord came to visit Abraham to tell him, 
you're going to have a son. Sarah, you're going to have a son. It's going to happen. And Sarah laughed. Some of you remember that. And they call him Isaac, which is laughter for Sarah laughed. Okay? So, they, these two angels are the same two that were with the Lord and Abraham eating and drinking, having a meal. Yes, they didn't fall. They are able to interact with us. They look just like us. In the previous chapter, chapter 18, they're called men. It says the Lord appeared with two men. But in chapter 19, now we're specifically told they're angels. Okay? And so it says they came and they, they met Lot and Lot was in the gate. And when he rose up to meet them, he bowed with his face to the ground. And he said, Behold now, my lords, turn in, I pray you, into your servant's house and tarry here tonight. Wash your feet, rise up early to go on your way, whatever you have to do. And, but come and stay with me. Now, why did Lot bow down before them? What did he see? He recognized something special about these two angels. And he entreated them to come into his house. They said, no, we will stay in the street. And then he pressed upon them greatly and said to them, no, come with me to my house. So they came into the house <coughs> and it says this, and they turned into him and they entered into his house and he made them a feast and baked them unleavened bread and they did eat. So here we have angels eating and drinking again. What I'm trying to get at to you is this. They have celestial bodies, but those celestial bodies can interact with our mortal earthly bodies, okay? The fallen ones sin the sexual sin. The holy ones have not done that. They stay pure. They keep their position with God, okay? Now, here, and, he, and it says here, but before they lay down to sleep that night, the men of the city, the men of Sodom, surrounded the house, old and young men, and they came from every area of the city. And they called to Lot and said to him, where are the men that came to you this night? Bring them out to us that we may know them. That word, those words, know them, are sexual words. They are not, we want to greet them, shake hands and say hello and say, hey, you know, I want to give you the key to the city. No, they were saying, they were surrounding the house. A mob gathered. I don't know how many men, let's say 50 or 80 or 100, gathered around Lot's house, banging on the door, send those men out. We want to have sex with them. They knew these were angels. They were going after strange flesh. They wanted different kind of flesh. The word strange means a different kind of flesh. There are, Paul tells us, celestial bodies and terrestrial bodies, heavenly bodies and earthly bodies. When heavenly bodies go after earthly bodies, they're going after strange flesh. When earthly people want to go after heavenly bodies, they want to go after strange flesh also. And by being sodomites, they wanted to have sodomy with them. Okay, so this is the reason why the Lord was destroying Sodom. This is the reason why he broke the tower down and confused the people. They stopped building the tower because they wanted to have strange flesh. They wanted sexual relations with fallen angels. They wanted a portal into the spiritual world. They wanted to be able to travel back and forth, let's say, into the spiritual world, into the fallen angels realm. And they wanted the power. They wanted that authority. They wanted to have that stuff. And, and that's what they were going after. And that's why the Lord flooded the earth. That's why the Lord confused their languages. And that's why the Lord destroyed the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. Okay? So again, why did he destroy the earth? He destroyed it because of strange flesh. That's the main reason why. He destroyed it because they wanted to go after people that they should not go after. And people wanted to go after the angels that they should not be going after. That's a different kind of flesh, as Kenneth Weiss says in his translation. All right, praise God. Now, 2 Corinthians 5 one through four, I told you about that, that uh, if we are clothed upon with a heavenly body, we will not be found naked, right? Talked about that. And I also talked about how these Nephilim now don't have an earthly body and they're not entitled to a heavenly body and so they are naked. And so they are trying to get into a body so that they're not naked, so that they're clothed upon with something else with a person so they seek to possess people and that's what they're trying to do so god brought judgment upon the earth several times simply because of this going after strange flesh the angels went after it 
and people wanted to go after it also. And now if we know who the people who lived in the area of Babylon, the Tower of Babel, we know who they were. These were the people of Nimrod, the great king. All right. Nimrod, the Bible says, was a mighty hunter before the Lord. That phrase before the Lord means in God's face. He was a mighty hunter in God's face. He was sticking his fist up to God and saying, I've got the power. I'm the man. And the Bible tells us that he had begun, he began to be a mighty man. And that word is Geborim in Hebrew. And the Geborim, the mighty men, this is not the same as like David's mighty men. It's a, talking about something different. It says he began to be a mighty man. And what many Bible scholars believe is that, that Nimrod was interacting with the fallen angels and they were doing something with his DNA to turn him into a hybrid. Some angelic DNA and human DNA mingled together, creating another hybrid. Nephilim become demons, exactly. The dead Nephilim are the demons that are in the Bible. People always wonder, you know, what are demons? They are the spirits of the dead Nephilim. And that's why they want to possess people because they want to live inside a body like they used to. And so they're, they're evil, and they'll make people who are possessed do evil things also. So that's, that's our, our, our talk tonight about strange flesh. I want you to understand this. And most of all, I want you to understand several things. In Genesis 18, we see the Lord come with two men. And in Genesis 19, we find out that they're angels. In Genesis 18, the Lord and the two men have a meal with Abraham. In Genesis 19, the two men have a meal with Lot. So what I'm trying to show you is that angels have a different flesh, but they can interact in this world of ours. Okay? Now, if you remember, Paul the Apostle talks about, he says, I know a man who was taken up into the third heaven, not the second heaven. The second heaven is the realm of of the fallen angels. The third heaven is the realm of God. And he said, I was taken up into the third heaven. And he was there. We also know that Enoch was translated from this realm right to the third heaven. We also know that Elijah was translated from this realm into the third heaven. So they, what we understand here is something that Andy was trying to bring up before about different bodies, you know, can they interact and this and that. There are lawful interactions between angels or angelic beings and human beings. And they can be conversation, they can be God giving a message, they can be food, eating, drinking, talking, whatever it may be. But when it comes down to fallen angels or people desiring to have sex with fallen angels, angels having sex with people, people wanting to have sex with angels, this breaks God's code. It is an unholy thing. It's an abomination, and God demands it to be judged. And it's been judged several times in the Word of God. So that's what we're seeing here tonight. And what I'm getting at now is this. We've talked about this a little bit, and we're going to get into this more as the weeks go by. As it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be at the coming of the Son of Man. In the days of Noah, what happened? Fallen angels interacted unlawfully in a sinful manner with human beings, corrupting the human race, corrupting the animal kingdom. And as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be now at the coming of the Son of Man. Fallen angels are coming back again, and they're going to be doing things that are unlawful, and they're going to be creating a hybrid race again. In fact, many believe they're doing it already. I'm, I believe they're doing it already. I believe that this stuff has been going on for years now, that hybrids are being created and, and made, and uh, all sorts of things are taking place, and we'll talk again as the weeks go by, talk about different things. I'm trying to lay some foundationary things here. And uh, 
Before I go any further, I want to remind you about my book, Spiritual Warfare. Now, you can pick this up at Amazon.com. Just go to Amazon and type in Frank Dupre, Spiritual Warfare, and the book will pop up and you can buy it there. You can get it in a Kindle and you can also get it uh, in a paperback, okay? Very inexpensive online. I'm not trying to make a lot of money, just trying to make it available. So, uh, you can also pick up a copy of that there. And in that book, you're going to find a lot of different things about the spiritual realm and spiritual warfare and how you have authority in that realm and how God wants you to be able to uh, have that authority in your life, keeping you, protecting you, okay? And giving you the ability to walk with God and to serve Him in a way that you don't have to be afraid. There's a verse in the Bible and it's in Psalm 119, verse 114. Those of you who use the Bible app, uh, it, you probably saw it was uh, the verse of the day, I think two days ago. It's Psalm 19, verse 114. It says, Thou art my hiding place, and I trust in your word, and your word gives me hope, confidence. When we look at the Word of God, and we see things that are going to take place. When we go into the days of Noah and then bring them into today, scary. No doubt about it. But if we get into the Word of God and read the things that God is trying to build us up with, spiritual bodybuilding, we'll have confidence. We'll be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Now remember, Paul the Apostle talks about the evil day that's coming, and he says, Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand in the evil day. You don't want to cower in fear. You don't want to have fear tormenting you. Fear has torment. But perfect love casts out fear. How in the world did Christians in the early days of the church ever go through the things they went through? Through the persecution and the torment and the torture and the things. that How did they go through that? How do Christians go through that today in certain nations in Africa? in communist China, in certain cities in the Philippines, in certain places there, in India, in, in Iran, Iraq, in Afghanistan, Pakistan. How do Christians go through what they're going through and still hold on to their faith? In the evil day, they are clothed with the armor of God. You see, you don't have a heavenly body right now, but you can take the armor of God and protect yourself spiritually and you can stand in the evil day and in his word you can find hope and confidence so that you're not afraid see when you go deeply into god's word when you go deeply into the words of jesus and i'm talking specifically about reading the life of jesus reading the teachings of the apostles in their letters getting the new testament inside of you through and through and through. I told the lady today, I said, are you reading your Bible every day? She said, no, I'm not. I said, you need to take 15 minutes a day and start reading your Bible. Now, go into the Gospel of Luke, I said, and start reading the Gospel of Luke every day, 15 minutes a day. Just read one chapter and then talk to the Lord. Lord, show me what this means to me. Make me strong in you. Teach me, Lord, your ways. When you do that, you're going to be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. When you do that, you're going to know the things you need to know. Okay? Now, uh, Edgar's throwing in some uh, different things. He's got a lot of uh, knowledge already on this stuff that I'll be talking about again in the future here. This is from an article from LifeNews.com, May 27, 2021. Scientists vote to allow growing babies in the womb for 40 days to kill them for research. Can you believe that? Yeah. Everything that happened in Noah's day is going to happen again now. An international group of scientists has ditched ethical guidelines in, to, in order to allow them to pursue grisly experiments to grow unborn babies in the womb for 40 days for the sole purpose of killing them for research. They want to, you know the research they want to do? They want to take their, their uh, stem cells. They want to take their organs. They want to start to mingle them with animal stuff and create chimeras and do that. You know, the Chinese are well ahead of us in this area. They're creating already bionic soldiers, super strength, super fast, night vision without goggles. They're doing all these things already. And believe me, 
The American Army is doing it too. DARPA is developing these things. They're creating these things. They're working on these things. All these things are happening. And that's, what, that's, why, that's why it's so important to understand that as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be at the coming of the Son of Man. So let's close with this note, this thought, okay? We want to walk in hope. We want to walk in faith. And we want to walk in love. Now, if you remember, in Ezekiel and in Revelation, and you can check these out, in Ezekiel, God tells an angel, go around and mark on the forehead everyone that is weeping over Jerusalem. Everyone that's weeping over Jerusalem. In Revelation, the Lord tells an angel, Go and mark all mine, all those that are mine, all those that have their name in the book of life. Mark them with a mark on their forehead so that when these terrible things come on the earth, they will be protected. God protected his people in Egypt, and God will protect his people today. Now, not everybody qualifies for that protection. Not everybody is walking with God. Romans 8.28 tells us that all things work together for good for those who, lo who love the Lord and are the called according to his purpose. They have to be the called, not just be Christians, be the elect, be the ecclesia, those who are growing in Christ, the sons of God. We will walk in confidence. We will serve the Lord and we will walk in confidence. So again, I just want to encourage you, get a copy of my book, Spiritual Warfare, and let the Lord begin to work in your life, building you up, giving you strength, giving you wisdom, and giving you understanding. Okay? Go to Amazon, put in Frank to Pray, Spiritual Warfare, and you'll find the book. And also, if you have read it already, or if you get it, write a review. Please write a review that will help this book to, be, to go up higher in the, in the algorithms that Amazon uses and things like that. Okay? So I'd appreciate if you do that and work with me on that, okay? Now again, remember, we want to walk in faith, we want to walk in hope, we want to walk in love. And we're going to do that as we get closer to God and as we get closer to the Holy Spirit, as we are trusting in the Lord. You know, Gio's, her message now for over a year, two, three years now, is get close to the Holy Spirit. He is here to lead us and guide us into all truth. All the truth we need to walk in faith, to walk in hope, and to walk in love is here right now with the Holy Spirit. So let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, in these days that are so uncertain, in these days that are like the days of Noah, we're asking you, Lord, to give us favor in your word, in the Spirit. Holy Spirit, we call upon you and ask you to lead us and guide us into all truth so we can walk with you. Can you say amen? Amen. All right, everybody, God bless you. In Jesus' name, I pray that God be with you. I look forward to seeing you in church on Sunday, and I look forward to seeing you next week.
the last days, the days of Noah, transhumanism, fallen angels, Nephilim, all these subjects are things we'll be talking about as the weeks go by. Share it with your friends. Let people know they can go to www.frankdupre.online and they can watch these videos again and they can go back and watch the past weeks also. God bless you all.